I just want to quickly welcome everyone to uh, the Department of Medicine Grand Round um, uh, on this February the 13th, day before Valentine's Day. And we are excited to have the Chief Resident um, Clinical Pathologic Conference. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Martin Campbell, our Chief Resident at Emory University Hospital. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong. Very happy to be here with you all. Just going to go ahead and share my screen so you can all see the slides. Okay. Can everyone see? Perfect. All right. Sounds good. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our spring resident clinical pathologic conference. I'm delighted to be here with you all today. And I think we have an excellent case discussion that will make us all better clinicians by the end of the talk. Uh, first and foremost, let's start with introducing our discussants for today. Uh, first, we have Dr. Nikki Wyman. Uh, she is a categorical PGY-1 in our internal medicine residency program. She attended Emory for medical school and is interested in hospital medicine and palliative care. She was the adjacent intern on the team who cared for this patient being discussed today and will be navigating us through the patient HPI and objective findings. Next, we have Dr. Colin Washington. He, too, attended Emory for medical school. Then he went on to complete his IM training in chief year at UT Southwestern and has returned to our department as an assistant professor and was recently promoted to associate program director of the J. Willis Hurst Internal Medicine Program. We have Dr. Aaron Anderson, who is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology. He serves as director of the ultrasound lab at Grady Hospital in the Marcus Stroke Center. He attended medical school at Indiana University School of Medicine and completed his residency training at University of Alabama. He has a passion for teaching and a particular practice focus in vascular neurology. We have Dr. Ferris Akpik, who is a neurointerventionist. He attended medical school at Yale before completing his internship at the Brigham and his residency training at Mass General Hospital in Boston. He is specialized in neurointerventional radiology and neurocritical care. He is an assistant professor in the departments of neurology and neurosurgery. And lastly, we have yours truly. I attended Morehouse School of Medicine for medical school and obviously did my residency training in internal medicine here at Emory. I'm the current uh, medicine resident at Emory University Hospital, and I recently matched in the cardiovascular fellowship here at Emory. Regarding financial disclosures, we only have one, which belongs to Dr. Colin Washington and is listed here. So what do I want you all to learn today? So the things I want us all to appreciate from this talk are the following. I want us to learn to take a very uh, nonspecific neurologic complaint and effectively use a framework to generate a focused differential diagnosis. Next, I want us to improve on our neurologic physical exam skills and use the information obtained from it to help localize the pathology. And lastly, I want us to recognize the role of imaging in arriving at our final diagnosis. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, now let's, uh, sorry. Okay, now I would like to have Dr. Wyman take us through a case of bilateral leg weakness and pain. Thank you, Martin. So this man's chief complaint was, I can't move my legs. In terms of his HPI, he was a, a 60 year old man who presented with pain and weakness in both of his legs. At baseline, he's very active. He hikes, runs, and walks two to three miles multiple times per week. About an hour before his symptom onset, while he was outside walking his dog, he bent down to pluck some weeds. And as soon as he stood up, he felt that his legs were asleep, which he described as a numbness and tingling sensation and shooting pain. He developed sharp pain in both feet initially, and that gradually progressed from the tops of his feet into the back of his calves and then toward the back of his thighs toward his buttocks. Over time, that became worse and more intense. So over the next 30 to 35 minutes, he began to feel unsteady on his feet, but was able to continue walking for approximately half an hour, at which point his feet and legs began to feel weak, forcing him to sit down. He attempted to rise from a seated position, but was unable to. He called his wife to pick him up and she arrived and had to help him into the car before taking him to the emergency department. So at the time of his arrival, he described worsening weakness and numbness in both legs. Prior to his arrival, he was able to have a bowel movement, um, 
but he noted being unable to sense that bowel movement in addition to having difficulty urinating. He endorsed numbness in his scrotal and groin regions and his perianal area. He also endorsed feeling like his feet are dragging. Notably, he does have chronic low back pain, which is related to a previous motor vehicle collision, which left him with two crushed discs. However, his chronic low back pain hasn't changed recently, and he denied having any back pain at the time of this presentation. He also 10 years ago experienced some nerve impingement issues after which he used a cane, but those symptoms resolved after about four days. In terms of his past medical history, he has a history of hyperlipidemia, alcohol use disorder, and chronic low back pain following the motor vehicle accident. No past surgical history. He has a history of Parkinsonism in his father and stroke in his mother. He's on trazodone, 50 milligrams as needed, sildenafil, 100 milligrams as needed, and then daily atorvastatin, 40, and has no known drug allergies. In terms of his social history, for his alcohol use, he does consume seven to eight servings of alcohol per week, usually no more than four drinks per day. So he consumed a total of seven drinks the day prior to his current presentation. He does occasionally endorse marijuana use, denies any tobacco or other recreational drug use. Notably, he took a trip to Quito, Ecuador, approximately two weeks prior to his presentation. He works in consulting. He has a no flu shot this year, uh, was COVID vaccinated, and had not had any recent vaccinations. He's sexually active with a female partner, his monogamous with his wife. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Wyman. Now we will have Dr. Colin Washington share with us his diagnostic approach to helping this patient with this particular chief complaint. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Wyman, Dr. Campbell, and thank you for asking me to come share my diagnostic approach to this common medical problem. So just to start off, um, as I've developed mental frameworks for common patient presentations, I've realized that in order for the schemas to work in my mind, they need to be both functional, but not overly specific too early on in a case. So to move, um, to, to use weakness as an example here, um, there are many different diagnoses to consider, but before jumping into an exhaustive list of diseases, I generally try to narrow down my differential with a few pieces of, inf of information, which I can obtain early on in the patient presentation to drive the rest of the history and the physical. So in this case, my first break point uh, for weakness and like many other chief complaints is actually acuity because I believe that the natural history and progression of symptoms can tell you a lot about the underlying pathophysiology and therefore your diagnosis. So in this case, we know that his symptoms um, onset to be acute. So I'll leave chronic for maybe another CPC conference. Um, after I determine acuity, I try and flush out early what exactly the patient means by weakness. So is this weakness more of a fatigue or in like a global pattern across the body. Um, this is really kind of my beginning step in attempting to localize the lesion as I was taught in medical school. Um, weakness related to something like adrenal insufficiency or hypokalemia does not tend to be specific to a certain part of the body and we'll have a more global presentation. So once I've determined that this is not a global weakness, I, I start to think about, is it focal? So, um, this is where really knowing your neuroanatomy comes back into play, uh, knowing how your motor signals travel from the brain down past the brainstem, out the frame of magnum, down the spinal cord, exiting the spinal column to reach your final destination and sensory inputs basically inversely traveling back to the spinal cord through a variety of tracks, which I once knew by heart, but often have to reference uh, as I move further away from medical school. Uh, really knowing that helps to narrow your differential. And, and Dr. Anderson, please let me know if I... Uh, if I was, if I've made a fool of myself being a, a bit too cursory with my understanding of neuroanatomy. Um, no, it's beautiful. No <laughs> comments. <laughs> so for a focal symmetric weakness, I think of diseases more in the periphery and spinal cord. So areas where a unifying lesion uh, or disease process can cause weakness across the midline. Um, I try to not focus exclusively on the nervous system in these cases um, because and I also include things like myopathies, um, but some further clues on the exam and some further histories will kind of help you to, to move that likelihood of disease up or down. For uh, asymmetric focal weakness patterns, I tend to focus more on individual nerve root compressions and mononeuropathies. Um, so I, I wanna highlight, I try and not say uh, bilateral versus unilateral 
and use the uh, delineation symmetric versus asymmetric, just so that I'm making sure to include a disease disease processes like multiple sclerosis. Um, and then additionally, also in the uh, asymmetric focal weakness side, I, I like to always think about MSK diagnoses, whether it's joint, joint diseases or ligamentous or tendinous injuries that are masquerading as weakness. Um, and so at this point, in cases where there's such an exhaustive li list of diagnoses, I try and leave the differential in disease categories as opposed to uh, specific diagnose diagnoses. Because uh, and, and these categories really are defined by a couple common characteristics from the exam, which I would expect. Um, and while and I, and I could use these to try and drive the rest of my history. So kind of moving forward at the point of this case, um, I, I try and discern down the pertinent information into a problem representation that I'll be able to use to apply to my diagnostic schema and activate my illness scripts, which warrant further investigation. So we have a 60-year-old man with a past medical history of DJD and chronic low back pain uh, coming in with acute onset non-traumatic bilateral lower extremity weakness and paresthesias with symptoms of saddle anesthesia and, and urinary symptoms. So to return back to my schema, that would put us in this uh, focal symmetric uh, box, uh, including polyneuropathies, myopathies, and, and spinal cord disease. So, and now, now that I've reached this point uh, to continue to kind of refine that and move forward a bit, um, what I will do is apply an additional test to that diagnostic group to see is there anything that I can I can take out. So, on the next slide, you can see um, that I we have these three diagnosis diagnostic categories for acute symmetric bilateral weakness, and when I apply the additional test of what would I expect to be associated with a sensory loss? You're really left with these two, this uh, of two broad categories of spinal cord disease and polyneuropathy. Myopathies, I, I in my head tend to be painful, um, but I wouldn't expect a sensory loss, so that's why I uh, removed it at this point. So now that I've gotten to these two diagnostic categories, this is where I start to really consider specific diagnoses within these groups. Um, and now that I have this this list on the um, next slide, it'll help It'll help me to be more targeted in the information that I go and obtain in the rest of the history and physical, as well as uh, with the initial diagnostic workup. Um, so I think at this point, we might have a little bit more information coming in the case, and then I will, I will chime back in. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington, for all of your wonderful insights. Um, so now let's have Dr. Wyman um, give us some additional information to kind of help tease these things out. Absolutely. So in terms of his physical exam, his vital signs were normal on presentation with a temperature, uh, a febrile heart rate of 96, slightly hypertensive, blood pressure of 147 over 78, satting well on room air. Uh, generally, he was well-developed, well-nourished, and no, no acute distress. Uh, in terms of his uh, HE and T exam, anecteric sclera, normocephalic, atraumatic, moist mucous membranes, oropharynx without any erythema or exudate and good dentition. His neck was supple, non-tender with normal range of motion and no cervical lymphadenopathy. His cardiovascular exam, completely normal again, regular rate and rhythm, uh, no murmurs, gallops or bubs, no lower extremity edema. Lungs cleared auscultation bilaterally with easy work of breathing, abdomen soft, non-tender, non-distended, no palpable splenomegaly, and no rashes evident on his skin. And then on his neurological exam, uh, for his mental status exam, he was awake, alert, oriented times four with fluent language following three-step commands. Cranial nerves two through 12 were all intact. On his motor exam, he had normal muscle bulk and tone, his bilateral upper extremities had five out of five strength, both proximally and distally. His leg showed slight drift bilaterally, and he had five out of five hip flexion and uh, five out of five knee flexors and extensors with zero out of five strength in the bilateral dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, ankle eversion, and ankle inversion. For sensation, he had decreased pinprick temperature and vibration below the ankles in the bilateral lower extremities with intact proprioception, light touch in the bilateral upper extremities and lower extremities. They did note rectal anesthesia on that exam. His reflexes were three plus in his biceps, triceps, and brachioradialis, as well as three plus in the patellar reflexes bilaterally. 
He had absent reflexes in the Achilles and plantars bilaterally with downgoing Babinski and negative Hoffman's. For coordination, his finger to nose was intact bilaterally and the gait exam was deferred due to his weakness. On his basic labs, normal white count at five, normal hemoglobin of 14.4. Um, on his CMP, he had a sodium of 136, potassium at 4.7, bicarbon normal at 26, and creatinine at 1.03. Um, and then normal AST and ALT, alkafos, bilirubin. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyman. So now that we have that additional information, let's have Dr. Washington revisit his differential diagnosis. So the the exam uh, the exam supports obviously a lot of what he said in his history, right? The the decreased lower extremity strength and decreased strength in the lower extremities as well as these um, this sensory loss. So putting those kind of lumping them together, obviously the decreased strength, the decreased sensation, the hyporeflexia all all favor kind of a lower motor neuron disease. Um, I, I, I might consider being a little bit more intentional on in how we, uh, dis how we, how we examine or describe the, the sensory loss. Um, is this more of like a sensory loss that is in a sock-like pattern around his leg and all the way down, or is it more dermatomal as I try and really hone in on exactly where I think the lesion is, um, especially given the presence of the rectal anesthesia, seeing if we can find a dermatome to try and uh, backtrack to a specific spinal uh, spinal nerve. Um, and so not just so obviously his neuro exam is has a number of abnormalities on it, but I always think it's important to highlight um, what is a pertinent negative on the exam, especially given the differential that we've driven or differential that we've generated to this point. So thinking about um, neuropathies related to other diseases, something like lupus, I would not expect to see um, just purely neurologic findings in the absence of anything else, but I'm sure uh, one of my rheumatology colleagues in the chat might might tell me otherwise. But it does help to move something like lupus down on my differential. Also, the labs are uh, largely unremarkable in my eyes. Uh, nothing really jumps out immediately, but it does take a couple of the diagnosis off the table for us. Things like uremia does, obviously, it seems much less likely in somebody who's BU and is normal. Um, but with this additional information, I'm able to refine my differential a good bit, but I want to circle back on something um, said early, early on by the patient, um, really trying to reapply again to our differential this concept of the acuity of his symptoms. So if you remember, he had an acute or even what, some I could, what you might call a hyperacute onset of his weakness. So applying that to the uh, shortened list, uh, the, a short, to the shortened differential that I, we had before, um, I kind of, I, I end with, uh, at this portion at least, with something like Guillain-Barre or acute intermittent porphyria as my acute onset um, weakness and paresthesia type uh, diagnoses, although with porphyria, you might expect some other symptoms, so that's less likely to me, um, but I still think uh, something like a spinal cord compression or disease in spinal cord warrants um, consideration or further further thought. Um, thank you. Awesome. So we have a little bit more information that we're going to share with you all. So here um, is a photo of the MRI imaging we obtained on hospital day one. Though I am not a radiologist, um, I like to point out an abnormal finding in the cardioquinal nerve roots uh, located here. So for the reads from the actual radiologists, um, he had a CT head without contrast that showed no acute intracranial abnormalities. He also had an MRI of the CT and L spine, uh, which showed no sig spinal signal cord abnormality or compression. It showed scattered enhancement along the cauda equina nerve roots, which were considered to relate to possible underlying infectious or inflammatory polyradiculopathy. It also showed multilevel degenerative changes of the entire spine most significant at C5 to C6, where there was multiple, mild spinal canal stenosis and severe bilateral neural foraminal narrowing. His CT abdomen and pelvis without contrast showed no acute findings in the abdomen or pelvis and demonstrated degenerative changes, particularly at L4 to L5. So additionally, on hospital day two, we obtained an LP. The opening pressure was not recorded. Um, 
did show a mild elevation in the protein at 454, glucose of 59, a gram stain in culture that were negative, and a negative meningitis encephalitis panel. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Weinman and Dr. Washington for your excellent discussion points. Uh, we will now have Dr. Anderson with neurology take us through his thoughts on this case from a, neuro from a neurology perspective. And how y'all doing? Hopefully you can hear me well. Um, so with uh, neurology, we're coming in and trying to help figure out the bilateral leg weakness and difficulty walking. And here I'm kind of pulling out kind of the place markers from the history and how as a neurologist I hear about and what I start thinking as the patient is describing it. So in this case, over the course of 30, 35 minutes, the patient went from walking to not walking and started with somewhat of an unsteady gait. And that unsteady gait, that's, that's always our question of, is this something that is is new or is it newly recognized? So if somebody has some sensory loss and they're having difficulty walking, they notice it until it becomes more severe to where they then start tripping. So that acuity, walking to not walking, that started with unsteady gait, is there some relationship to sensory that can uh, play a role? All right. I hopped on and hopped back off. Y'all still hear me? Now we can. Okay. That's, don't know what should happen there. So, um, so in this case with that unsteady gait uh, prior to walking, the bilateral leg weakness, no involvement of the upper extremity, no involvement of all the cranial nerves are intact. Um, with the legs, weaker after or they were worsening after arrival to the ER and anytime I start hearing that the feet are dragging it's two things either the weakness is there but it's also somewhat of a red flag that pops up of if I'm dragging my foot that's actually increasing the friction which now you're actually using more strength to drag the foot forward which might put more into that uh, supertentorial functional weakness if I'm dragging my foot. Everything else fits that there's difficulty walking, there's some weakness that are there, he's, wor he's worsening on arrival. So trying to evaluate what could be going on, but that's kind of one of the markers that popped up. Once I hear that, I have to say, well, what does the exam show? Um, and then, the part of unable to feel the needing to use the uh, have a bowel movement and difficulty urinating that goes along with the saddle anesthesia that's localizing more towards the spinal cord. You can have peripheral nerve involvement that then takes away your ability to have bowel movement or control your urine, but trying to balance that of peripheral versus central, we're kind of now looking away from the brain more towards spinal cord or peripheral nerves uh, with this patient, with these from the history. Um, another thing that I would have added or wanted or asked my resident overnight, uh, if they were seeing this patient in the ER, of uh, looking for a sensory level. Anytime you have some decreased pinprick that's happening distally and it's bilateral lower extremities, uh, checking to see is there a sensory level coming up the back you can then confirm it on the abdomen, but checking for a sensory level gives us kind of a target to say, is there possible acute cord involvement? And you can have a hanging sensory level. So if there's a sensory level across the lower spine, where I would image would most likely be the thoracic and lumbar because there's no upper extremity involvement. What then brings me to say, we should probably add on the cervical spine is because there's brisk reflexes everywhere except for the ankles. Um, so trying to figure out where that could be, now I have some involvement involving in the upper extremities. And these are the red flags or red herrings. Both of them are information that we use. And 
the question about alcohol use disorder, because there's some issue with math of I don't drink more than eight in a week, but in the last 24 hours, I had seven. So is there more alcohol use that we're not uh, being uh, told? Again, usually that's going to be posterior lateral columns. You'll have difficulty walking because you can't feel where your legs are. Uh, you can involve your lateral columns as well, which then can have the paresthesias, um, some painful sensation with that occasionally, uh, and then involved in the cortical spinal tracts leading to some weakness. So, and then the chronic low back pain. History of, he used a cane for four days. Is this just a worsening presentation of what happened 10 years ago? Um, and this is something where usually the pain radiating down one leg can be there. Um, and then involvement of the bowel bladder, does that take away from just a radiculopathy versus a central uh, source? Um, the Ecuador twip, trip. Uh, I uh, love my ID colleagues and I have no problems calling them and saying what labs to add to my CSF studies that uh, we will be definitely checking for this patient. Uh, and then the, that sharp pain radiating up that then points towards like a radiculopathy or peripheral nerve involvement. Uh, but having this acute pain, could there be some also involvement, acute cord where there's a spinal cord infarct? The conus medullaris, I've had a couple patients that had uh, some pain on presentation with the weakness. Uh, although like bilateral radiculopathy or acute cord compression is much higher on that possibility, especially with his history of degenerative disc disease from uh, injuries that he's had in the past. So coming back again, adding that differential diagnosis, the bilateral lower extremity weakness and numbness inflammatory, the acute uh, inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, Guillain-Barre, it's usually over the course of days. That's the question of the gait instability. Did that start before and now it's just worse? And then it's worsening now uh, as presenting. So that could fit with the acute recognition instead of the onset was actually a, a day or two ago. Um, transverse myelitis can be acute. Usually there's pain or a band-like sensation going across the location, whether it's across the chest or across the abdomen. Um, so that's there. Putting on the rapid onset, the uh, ischemia of the cord, you want to ask any recent neck adjustments, car accidents, uh, abdominal surgeries, which would be part of the history. We would hear that already. Um, and then the spinal cord compression uh, has that history of uh, degenerative disc disease. It can be acute, uh, can be severe, and, and cause some uh, myel myelopathic symptoms. Again, that information, the three plus reflexes, it absent except, well, three plus reflexes except for the Achilles, having that decreased sensory uh, with that pinprick vibration, trying to see is there a sensory level with that. The rectal anesthesia points a little bit more towards the central cause, um, though it can be present with uh, Guillain-Barre and, and peripheral nerve involvement. Uh, and then having the drift in both legs and then absent ankle toe movements, this is where localizing you would point more towards looking towards a peripheral versus uh, central with the cord involvement. With the imaging, the CT head is kind of a bonus. We get that as patients come through the ED. Um, but in this case, there's no mental status change, cranial nerve involvement. Uh, it's not something where that radiation wasn't really beneficial. Um, if you do have bilateral leg weakness and it's painless, then you may want to you want to look at the uh, brain to say, did you have ACA, uh, anterior cerebral artery uh, stroke involvement? In this case, with the MRI, CT, and L spine, we have um, uh, with the Bruce reflexes I mentioned yielding the need to get the C spine. We found that canal stenosis C56, and then we have the scattered enhancement along the pottery equina nerve roots can be infectious versus inflammatory polyradiculopathy. And that's where we try to tie that information back in. Uh, could this be a presentation with that AIDP Guillain-Barre uh, possibility that you can see that nerve root enhancement. Sarcoid, 
uh, other uh, rheumatology uh, uh, abnormalities can also lead to uh, nerve root enhancement. So it's not one specific uh, diagnosis, but getting the labs uh, would be beneficial as well. The protein, we have a gene green, uh, uh, Dr. Green, Jim Greenisms, where for every one year of life, you get one point on your protein. So this individual is 60 years old, so 54, it is above the Emory cutoff of 45. So it's slightly elevated, but it's not above the threshold that gets uh, Jim Green excited about patients, but it is elevated. Um, so here combined with the MRI, now we can't necessarily ignore it. So it's, it fits where there's involvement, uh, peripheral nerve involvement. You have MRI findings consistent and concerning for GBS. You have lab that has ruled out infectious etiologies. I think we absolutely at this point initiate treatment for the possibility of Guillain-Barre, but then it's coming back to how do you correlate this with the history? Um, and that history with that acute onset, yes, AIDP has the word acute on it, but we're distinguishing between chronic, which is beyond four weeks, and acute, which is usually uh, the uh, maximal deficits within two weeks of onset. So that piece where that serial exam as a patient presents, it can worsen. Uh, as a patient's here with Guillain-Barre, so following reflexes, does the three plus reflexes start to diminish uh, in the patellars and the upper extremities? And then here again, because we're acutely looking for uh, cord compression, DWI sequences aren't typically part of the initial spine imaging unless specifically requested. So trying to tie that in. Uh, so here, when the history and the imaging doesn't match, so Guillain-Barre, we had the imaging showing nerve root enhancement, but the history is over one to two hours, the symptoms have worsened. And then you still have some three plus reflexes. So if it's acute onset, would I expect to already see the nerve root enhancement? Or does that fit with that unsteady gait that the patient had? Uh, for spinal cord infarct, here, the MRI spine's negative, but the history is acute. Again, DWI sequences aren't normally requested initially, especially when we're looking for structural lesions. In this patient, that's the highest concern with his history of degenerative disc disease. Um, core compression, there is uh, some signal change. There's um, canal stenosis, cervical, but no core contusion. Uh, so we would expect there would be a signal change there. And again, with transverse myelitis, it can be acute. Usually the pain is more band-like instead of radiculopathic uh, pain radiating up. Um, so here there's no cord signal change that would be there uh, with a acute onset of an inflammatory process happening within the spine. All right. So now let's get Dr. Wyman uh, to share with us some more information. All right. So we have our labs here. Um, he had a B12 of 419, a folate at 10.6, an A1C of 5.4, a TSH slightly elevated at 6.69, with a normal free T4 at 0.77. HIV was negative, RPR was non-reactive, and he had a negative quant gold test. ESR and CRP were both normal, negative INCA, DSDNA, and ANA screen, and then he had an unremarkable SPEP and UPEP. Uh, additional details from this LP on hospital day two, he was negative for all clonal bands. AFB and bacterial cultures were no growth. Uh, an autoimmune CSF panel was negative. And then tests for VZV, HSV, enterovirus, West Nile, CMV, and his VRD, VDRL were all negative. And ACE was also negative. All right. So here's a snapshot of the MRI on hospital day six um, showing an abnormality uh, within the conus medullaris at the level of T12. So there's the abnormal uh, T2 cord signal right there. And I, once again, I'm not a radiologist. They say that there is something looking funky right there. I'm just going to take their word for it. And then for the official read on that MRI, uh, they read it as a new abnormal cord signal, an enhancement with mild abnormal restricted diffusion within the central conus medullaris at the level of T12. 
differential considerations favor evolving spinal cord acute ischemia and less likely demyelination. All right, so now let's get back to our discussion. Um, now that we have these additional findings, let's see how Dr. Anderson incorporates this new information. Dr. Anderson? Yeah, it helps if I unmute, right? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, so yes, yeah, so here the labs and imaging Initially, we had the nerve root enhancement and giving the initial elevated protein, the initial treatment of Guillain-Barre uh, Guillain syndrome, starting that. And then in this case, like the patient not really improving, then warrant saying, let's go ahead and look at and repeating the imaging. Um, in this case, the CSF negative for any evidence of infection or other inflammatory causes. Again, oliconal bands is not specific for demyelination. It's, it is specific for uh, central um, inflammatory response. So it's not necessarily just a test that we're looking for multiple sclerosis or NMO. It's is there any CNS involvement of uh, inflammation beyond that of the peripheral? Uh, so again, when we come back to that history, that MRI, when it's ordered, acutely, we can use the MRI to try to get an idea of the timing. So with that new signal enhancement, we're looking to say, where does this fit in? And we're kind of in that early subacute uh, phase um, with uh, acute ischemia. We can use this for acute stroke with wake up stroke protocol. We uh, Patients come in through the ED, we acutely get an MRI and if our MRI shows changes of DWI and ABC changes without flare changes, then we know that that's somebody who probably is within the first three or first within six hours, and we can treat with uh, thrombolysis, IV thrombolysis, TPA, or TNK. Um, here in this case, we actually have still maybe some DWI changes. I agree with Dr. Campbell. I can't point at that DWI and say there's something there, but definitely there's a T2 flare hyperintensity, which now says we're beyond that first six to 72 hours. And they mentioned some slight enhancement. So that's where we will write in that two to five, two to six days of uh, the early subacute uh, ischemia involving the cord. Uh, and then here, I know we'll get into kind of the mechanism later, um, but uh, talking about uh, the possible uh, disc herniation of the nucleus propulsus that then embolizes to the central uh, cord uh, to cause that cord, uh, in this case, conus medullaris infarct. So if I then go back and say, with the history, if I include the key portions of the history of low back pain, degenerative disc disease, acute onset of the bilateral leg weakness, associated pain with saddle anesthesia after bending over to pull weed. So that's that acute load with the valsalva standing up then leads to that possibility of the mechanism uh, for uh, the cord. Awesome. Take off. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, for your excellent teaching points and discussion. We will now have Dr. Akbik discuss spinal cord strokes from the perspective of a neurointerventionist. All right, well, thank you all for the invitation to talk to you about spinal cord strokes in general. Um, you know, as you uh, can imagine, these are incredibly rare uh, things to see. So if you talk about a spinal cord and the walking well, i.e. not precipitated by trauma or surgery, this is a very, very uncommon thing to see. Uh, I think most of us have probably counted one or two hands on the number of patients that we've seen that kind of fit into that subset. Um, you know, there's a curious female predominance in these patient populations. I don't understand why, and I don't think anybody else does either. Um, and they're less likely to have the typical risk factors. And I think a lot of that has to do with the anatomy uh, or the ana anatomical considerations that precipitate this. What's weird or, or curious about these is that the symptoms typically evolve over hours. So if you think about somebody who has a cerebral stroke, right, somebody with an MCA syndrome, they pretty reliably tell you I was fine until I wasn't, and then I wasn't fine. It's very acute in, in its onset. They don't have this elaboration of symptoms over time. 
Intracranial hemorrhage patients will have this elaboration of symptoms typically over 10, 20, 30 minutes as the hematoma expands. But in a spinal syndrome, these symptoms will elaborate over hours. And that has a lot to do with the collateral circulation in the spine and essentially the kind of slow death um, that occurs with kind of progressive ischemia and diminished collateralization. And when these patients present, they typically have a flaccid areflexic paralysis. These patients typically have an anterior spinal syndrome, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but regardless, it's typically flaccid at onset with spasticity that comes on later, and they have dissociated sensory changes. So as you remember, you know, pain and temperature are in one set of fibers, proprioception and vibration are in another, and uh, because of the anatomical localization of those, you can have, you know, one set of deficits on one side and the other on the other side, and that's typical. That's typically localizing to a spinal syndrome. There are a couple areas of special consideration from a medical perspective. If somebody has a spinal cord infarction between C3 and C5, you know, that's where the phrenic nerve gets its innervation from, and those are patients that are extremely high risk for respiratory decompensation, are typically monitored in a neuro ICU setting uh, with mechanics and so forth. And interestingly, if you think about T4 to T9, so close to that thoracolumbar watershed region, there's a lot of splanchnic innervation that comes from there. And so those patients can actually have pre-refractory dysautonomia, hypotension, et cetera, um, that can come along with those infarcts. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, I think the anatomy here is very important to highlight because this dictates your etiology. And so as you can see here, um, I'm not totally sure if the mouse will show, but there's these paired vertebral arteries. So I can go back one second. Yep, there's the pair, these paired vertebral arteries. And off of them at the rostral segment, you have the anterior spinal artery that makes this Y. And then comes straight down the middle of the cord, the anterior medial sulcus essentially of the, of the cord. And the highlight here is if you just zoom out for a second, there's not many roads in. And so there are very few points of augmentation along a very long road. And so you have very few points of pressure augmentation of blood. And you can imagine that in, in, in between any two segments, the midpoint between them is going to be a watershed area. So if for whatever reason you have refractory hypertension, et cetera, that's where you can have a problem. And that's typically what we see. So just to kind of orient you to what you're looking at in the top right panel here, this is kind of a blown up picture of the anterior spinal artery kind of running in this central anterior sulcus, and then an axial view of the anterior spinal artery penetrating into the meat of the cord, really the gray matter, the really ventral and lateral portions of the cord. And in the back where one is um, highlighting here that the, the paired posterior spinal arteries, and these guys typically will feed together, will feed the posterior third of the cord on axial injury. And when we think about the syndromes, it's really dictated by the anatomy. And so if you have an anterior spinal artery stroke, and you can click for just once right now, finish, you'll take out more or less the, the front two thirds of the cord. And if you look in the schema over here, you'll take out the gray matter, you'll take out the lateral cortical spinal tract, et cetera, and you'll typically spare the posterior columns, which are the proprioception and vibration territories. You know, nobody reads the textbook in its entirety and, and behaves like that all the time. But that's a general gestalt for an anterior spinal syndrome. And this is typically the spinal syndrome that we do see in these patients who have spinal strokes. Now, on the flip side, if you have a posterior spinal artery stroke, this is very uncommon. Um, typically, these patients will have a predominantly posterior column syndrome. So they have this kind of tapes dorsalis, syphilitic kind of presentation, difficulty with proprioception, vibration, et cetera. Um, they have the sensory ataxia when they walk. This is rare because number one, the posterior um, spinal arteries are paired. And number two is that in contrast to the anterior spinal artery, there's many different points of augmentation in the system. And so um, you really have to be very unlucky with the way you were born and the collaterals that you have to develop a posterior spinal syndrome. It does happen, and I haven't seen it yet, but it is described. Um, so when we think about the anatomy of these spinal arteries, you know, I, I want to highlight how hard it is to do this, um, particularly to try to throw a clot in there. Um, so if you think about it, if you start in the heart and try to get down there, number one on the far left here, you've got to you got to go down the aorta, and then we're talking now the thoracolumbar watershed, right? So this is where artery of Ademkowitz is. This is the radiculomedullary artery, so the artery that that links the kind of intercostal arteries off of the aorta to the spinal cord and the anterior spinal artery. Right, so that's the artery of Ademco, it's here. So you've got to, number one, come down the aorta. Number two, you've got to take a 90 degree turn and almost like a back turn up a little bit into these radicular arteries. And then number three, if you come over here to the, to the next picture on the right, 
you'll see that once you come on the radicular artery, there's three branches. There's a ventral branch, there's a dorsal branch, and then right off the dorsal branch, there's a small spinal branch. And so you have to take the least likely of the three options, the smallest branch, and then you've got to nail the artery of adequates or the radicular medullary artery to get into the spinal artery. And by the way, you don't have a bunch of these arteries, right? The, the artery of Ademkowitz is on one side of one thoracic segment in the cord, right? And so you have to be that unlucky to nail that side and make all these turns. So as you can imagine, this is a very tough throw and it's pretty unlikely to occur in an embolic situation. It's almost always something that's branch occlusive on the kind of origin of the, of the intercostal artery or hypoperfusion precipitated by trauma, surgery, et cetera. And so as we move on to the next slide with kind of the etiology, it's really dictated by this anatomy. A lot of these patients, quite frankly, we don't have an answer for in terms of what precipitates their ischemia. But for patients, the most common thing we see are patients peri dissection. They have some kind of aortic aneurysm or thrombus that overlies the intercostal artery. They dissect and clip off that intercostal artery. There's some hypoperfusion episode during bypass surgery or whatever. Um, compressive etiologies can absolutely happen. So you can imagine if you have a, a disc compressing on the artery, remember this is anterior spinal, right? The disc is, uh, you know, I guess it's possible, but, but more likely it's gonna be venous hypertension that occurs and that decreases your perfusion pressure through the parenchyma of the cord. You know, and again, embolism is quite rare. Um, I'll, we'll talk about the fibrocarditis embolism in just a moment, um, just as a highlight, because this is actually a pretty curious mechanism. Um, but in terms of imaging, you know, for a regular kind of cerebral stroke patient, we'll usually say CTA head and neck, and make sure exonerate the relevant vessels. Because the spinal artery kind of runs rostral caudal all the way from the verts down to the iliacs, essentially, you more or less have to image that stem to stern. So I would do a CTA of the neck. You don't have to do a head per se, but you definitely have to do the neck. Um, actually, you do have to do head because you got to see the intradural portion. Um, and then you got to do a CT of the chest and the abdomen. And again, you're looking for any kind of aortic pathology, et cetera, dissections that can precipitate this. Now, the final point, which is interesting to this case, is this concept of fibrocartilaginous embolism. I'll be very honest with you. The first time this was invoked uh, on a patient when I was a resident, I just thought this was nonsense. Like, it's like, how did this get in there? Like, is that true, et cetera? Um, but this is pathologically proven. And so, you know, the disc material under some Valsalva pressure, as Dr. Anderson highlighted, gets extruded into the spinal circulation. And there's really um, uh, two ways that it can do this. Like once it gets in, it gets into the spinal circulation, it can actually go retrograde through the arterial system and back into the anterior spinal artery, or it can go anterograde into the venous system and precipitate venous hypertension. But either way, you can actually see disc material either in the cord or in the veins of the cord uh, precipitating this. And this was actually first described in a young woman who had a, a massive PE after a spinal stroke um, and found on autopsy. Now, when, we've, when we examine these patients acutely, the first question is, is this a surgical lesion? Is there a compressive etiology, right? That's the first fixable problem that this patient could have. And so typically we try to do some kind of hyperacute spine imaging. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, getting hyperacute MR is not always straightforward. And so a CT is very reasonable just to look for blood or something compressive acutely, right? That's a very reasonable thing to do, but almost all these patients will need an MRI if they can tolerate it to try to figure out, you know, is this some inflammatory, infectious, vascular lesion, et cetera. An LP is typically part of the story because we have this ambiguity of what's going on. Spinal strokes are the, the very, very small minority of these spinal pathologies that we see. And so we're looking typically for the, you know, vascular, I'm sorry, the autoimmune infectious kind of things. And so typically there's a panoply of labs that we send with these patients. And the other thing to consider is that could this be a tumor? Right, and so you would think about potentially a tumor surveillance, just have in pelvis, et cetera. Um, but that's a typical kind of first round evaluation for these patients. Now, just to highlight one of the things that we noticed here, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, that you know oftentimes the MRI is not uh, sensitive up front, um, or in retrospect you can see it, but you know prospectively it's hard to recognize. And part of that is because of the way we order these. You know, again, diffusion imaging is not part of our routine MR imaging for these patients. And so it's almost always the case the first MRI doesn't have diffusion sequences on it, which would be very helpful. Now, um, but as you go farther along into this, you know, post-stroke, I guess is a better way of saying it, it's actually much more obvious to see. And so uh, if you look here um, on B, this is your diffusion sequence. Oh, well, anyways, this is your diffusion uh, sequence in, sorry, C is what I meant to say. Um, and then B is your T2 axials. 
Um, and you can see the gray matter of the core. You really have to squint at B and C to really see a, a problem. It's very easy to kind of wash over this. And the other thing you should recognize is diffusion imaging in the cord is technically very challenging um, and hard to interpret, quite frankly. But in D, it's blazing and obvious, right? If you go back, sorry, one slide. Um, and in G, you can see on the axial images where the arrow is um, higher up, you can tell that, you know, there's pretty obvious um, swelling of the cord and so forth. And so oftentimes you have to image again to see something, uh, to see what you're looking for. So don't take your first MRS. As the as the gold of what's happening, um, there is this frequent invocation of the owl's eye sign. This was first described in the I guess in it was first reported uh, in 1987 or something, but coined as owl's eyes in 1990. So this is the, in the heyday, the very early days of diffusion imaging in MR. Um, this was described in an ischemia patient who had you know a spinal stroke, but has been, has since been described in a wide variety of diseases. So I'm not sure that it's super helpful. Um, in terms of pinning, if you see owl's eyes, you should definitely think stroke. It's just the first setting in which it was described. And oftentimes it's the first thing we think of, but certainly you can see it in all manner of, of conditions. So there are these consensus criteria that have been described for diagnosing a spinal stroke. And typically it's a non-traumatic acute onset syndrome that you have MR imaging that is supportive of some kind of intramedullary diffusion restriction, T2, T2 weighted signaling, et cetera, without compression. And you have relatively bland CSF and no better explanation for what's going on. Um, you know, this is just one set of criteria, but nevertheless, it's a general gestalt that basically says you have to have an acute spinal syndrome with some kind of supportive imaging uh, evidence and basically nothing else to go on. And that would make sense for a spinal stroke of various levels of, concert, uh, of confidence as they outlined on the bottom here. So when we talk about the acute management of these folks, unlike cerebral strokes, we're in the Wild West. Um, there's no guidelines, there's no trials, there's really nothing besides judgment and, and experience to try to guide the, the treatment of these patients. Um, there is a general practice in the field of augmenting circulation. So it maps greater than 90 typically for three to five days, depending on who you are and where you are. Um, and the reason for that, again, is remember, there's not very many points of entry into the core. And patients will actually improve a little bit with, with blood pressure augmentation, and then they kind of settle out one way or the other. Um, in terms of thrombolysis for reperfusion, this is a case reportable um, uh, thing. I mean, it, it's definitely been done. Uh, it's not done very often. And part of that is by the time you recognize that this is a spinal stroke or the patient recognizes that they need to come into the hospital, you know, it's not that often that they're within the window for intervention. Um, and so there's a lot of practical considerations where IVTPA is really very rarely uh, considered in these patients. Endovascular therapy is even rarer. I couldn't even find a single case report of this. Um, one of the things that's important to recognize is the anterior spinal artery is like a quarter to half a millimeter wide. That's like a hair, essentially, in terms of what we do. When we do thrombectomies in patients with cerebral strokes, the middle cerebral artery has like a two to two and a half millimeter diameter you know, farther out, maybe two, one and a half, but, you know, we're, we're like a 10th of the size almost in some of these spinal arteries. And so there really isn't a device that can take us there right now to, to meaningfully intervene. And, and remember the, the, the odds of it being thrombus are, are lower than, than the cerebral strokes. And so that's not really a, a common treatment modality. It's usually supportive with uh, blood pressure augmentation, and then a lot of kind of critical care that surrounds that. So thinking about uh, splanchnic derived hypotension, respiratory failure, uh, you know, gastric dysmotility, urinary incontinence, that kind of stuff. So the prognosis for these patients is actually a lot better than we appreciate. A lot of us simply have this kind of negative impression of what a spinal stroke recovery will be. Um, and if you actually track these patients over time, as this group at Mayo did, this is actually pretty impressive. If you look initially at the wheelchair uh, bound patients up front, so that's about 90% of them. If you go six to 12 months out, you know, that's about 30% of them. And so a lot of them shift from wheelchair to either walking unassisted or walking with some kind of assistive device. And so you can see the column of, above it kind of grades in a, in a positive direction. Um, but nevertheless, the mortality of these patients is, is still pretty significant. So about 50% of them will die within the first year. That typically has probably a reflection of what precipitated the stroke. Again, a lot of these patients are having some kind of massive coronary vascular surgery, had a big trauma, et cetera. Um, and so that I think that's more a reflection of what's precipitating the syndrome as opposed to the consequences of the syndrome. But nevertheless, that's hard to tease out given the relatively small patient population that we have. Uh, 
All right. I want to give a major thank you for all of our discussions. Um, I'm just going to briefly kind of like summarize the case and talk about some of these uh, take home points. All right. So what happened? Right. So for context, I was the internal medicine attending on service during this patient's admission. It was my first time ever acting as an attending, and I'm very thankful for all the support we received from all of our wonderful consultants. Um, to fill you in some additional details, um, on initial presentation, our leading diagnosis was AIDP. So he was empirically treated with IVIG. His improvement was minimal at first, but later improved significantly, which we later attributed to his willpower to work with physical therapy and his determination to walk again. Once the spinal cord stroke diagnosis was confirmed, we literally found him in his room attempting wall sits and squats. Um, another thing to note is that the stroke workup was otherwise unremarkable. The traditional risk factors that you think about for ischemic strokes, such as atherosclerotic um, disease risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and tobacco use, were not contributors in this case. And thromboembolic disease from intracardiac thrombi were not found on TTE or TEE. Therefore, um, leading us to suspect that this infarct was secondary to fibrocartilaginous embolism from his vertebral disc disease that was precipitated by his spine flexion. Um, and then uh, lastly, I want to point out that he made some significant improvement with physical therapy, and he was ambulatory by the day of discharge. Um, in terms of bowel function, um, he was able to regain that, but unfortunately, he continued to have urinary retention um, and required uh, intermittent catheterization upon discharge. So what are my takeaways? What did I learn from this patient? Um, so first, I like to think that uh, what stood out most is that imaging isn't everything. No matter how advanced our technology becomes, there is no substitute for good old-fashioned history and physical exam. Also, it's important to note that the imaging findings can change during the hospital stay, so it is okay to re-image when necessary. And when imaging does not fit the exam in history, we must revisit the differential diagnosis. Point number two. Timing is key, right? I believe the single greatest clue we had to nailing the correct diagnosis in, the, uh, in this patient is the timing of his symptoms. And it's also important to note that it's not good enough to just say he presented with an acute onset bilateral lower extremity weakness. We really need to push ourselves as clinicians to be precise about the onset and tempo of illness. So for example, in this case, it would probably be better to describe him as um, a hyperacute syndrome with a maximal intensity at symptom onset. Think about how aortic dissection and acute coronary syndromes um, cause acute chest pain, but the tempo of each of them is usually quite different. Knowledge at that level of precision is what makes us better clinicians, I believe. Point number three is to listen to your patient because they may know more than you. Actually, on hospital day two, while we were still banking on the AIDP diagnos uh, diagnosis, he shared with us a case report about spinal cord stroke. And had we considered this sooner, we may have arrived at the diagnosis perhaps a day or so earlier. I don't think it would have changed the management, but we have to have humility if we want to truly become lifetime learners. And my last point is to never take anything for granted. This gentleman was essentially healthy prior to all of this and within minutes went from walking to not walking. Life and health are both gifts and we should treat them both as such. So with that being said, um, I want to say thank you again for all of you for being here uh, today. We're finishing exactly right at one o'clock. Um, thank you to Dr. Fackey for all of his help um, throughout putting the slides together, all of our wonderful discussants, um, Dr. Wendy Armstrong, and all of you. Um, and we're happy to take questions now. Martin, I think we are at the top of the hour, so I don't know that we have time for questions. I'm going to um, also um, thank um, you for those really lovely reflections and really salient points at the end, as well as all of our discussions. This was fantastic. And I uh, want to absolve you of thanking me because all I did was make you pick a date for this uh, event. So um, so beyond that, that was my contribution. But um, thank you, guys. This was really thoughtfully put together, and I learned a ton. Uh, so appreciate it.